Eric, I want to start with you. Can you just set the stage for us? Walk us through the numbers here. And is such a price tag actually achievable? We'll see, certainly. This is the report that was commissioned by the UN two years ago after the Paris Accords. And it doesn't deliver great news. It presents a very strict timeline that we have to reduce global emissions before 2030. Uh, they suggest that on something on the order of 55 or, or 60 percent uh, cuts in global emissions below last year levels by 2030. Uh, and then zeroing out emissions by 2050. So that is, uh, that is a huge challenge and represents ambition we have not yet seen, even from the uh, nations that were so supportive of the Paris Agreement three years ago. Emily, what's your take on these numbers? Well, the technology is there to reduce emissions, but we haven't been deploying it at scale. We haven't been investing enough. Um, and what the report points out as well is that to keep emissions under a level that would limit the impacts of climate change, we need to capture a lot of carbon emissions. And this is technology that is not ready at scale. So talk to us about how we get there. I mean, what's it going to take for that technology to be ready? Well, for technology to be useful, someone needs to turn it on, and nobody has turned on the technology at this point to the scale that is needed. We don't have the political will, certainly not in the US, but even in other countries, it's not moving fast enough. And we don't have the investments to follow suit. The technology is there for uh, carbon-free uh, energy, for reducing emissions across a number of activities, and also for preparing and adapting to climate change. We're just not using it So right who now. needs to turn it on? I mean, who, who are the um, people who can make this happen and the companies that can make this happen? Right. So the obvious answer is governments, but governments may not be there yet. So um, there's a lot going on in the private sector, and there has been a lot of mobilization from investors and from corporations to invest. That needs to come with a regulatory push. It can't just be all one, uh, because the companies that are pushing this type of effort are still a minority compared to the broader set of corporations out there. Right. Eric, what's the likelihood that that big tech tech or, or, or big business could do some of this on their own? We already see really hopeful stories from around the world of enormous investment in technologies that have matured in some ways faster than, than even close watchers of the space uh, would have believed, particularly in solar, in, in wind power, and the electrification of automobiles. Uh, I'd like to echo uh, Emily's point about the, the carbon capture technologies. These are very interesting projects that are getting a lot of attention and some money. Uh, it, but I, one thing that, that's worth considering, uh, we also saw today the awarding of the 2018 Nobel Prize in Economics to William Nordhaus of Yale University. And he's spent most of the last three or four decades trying to uh, understand the relationship between what cost of pollution is, what, what is the appropriate price for a ton of emissions, uh, with the consequent reduction in emissions. And so uh, many economists will tell you that uh, people respond to prices, people respond to incentives. And having uh, uh, a price on carbon, the economists will tell you, and there are many experiments uh, around the world, uh, may be needed to get these technologies up and running in time to meet the challenges outlined today in the report. Emily, what are the consequences if this stuff doesn't happen? You know, well, what is the difference between you know one degree Celsius and three degrees Celsius? We're already seeing the consequences of not having done our homework before, and we're seeing it today. We're seeing it with extreme weather events, a new hurricane barreling down Florida. Japan just had nine typhoons in the past season, which is insane when you think of it. Um, so the impacts are already there. They're only going to get worse. And a half degree difference between one and a half Celsius degree by 2040 or two degrees make a tremendous difference. This is the average across the entire Earth. And so you have to imagine the amount of changes that need to happen to move the needle by half a degree globally. And that means more extreme weather events. That means water scarcity. That means more wildfires. That means sea level rise and losing our coastlines. That means a tremendous amount of impact that we're not currently adequately prepared for. Eric, meantime, you've got 
Some big tech companies, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, teaming up to develop AI to identify um, impending famine. Talk to us about how this works. That was a it's very interesting project that was uh, announced today by those uh, those particular tech leaders, and the the goal of that project is to look for natural and social metrics that uh, when uh, when certain alarm bells go off uh, on, among each of them, it may be an overall early warning signal could be interpreted as an overall early warning signal for famine. Uh, one thing that's interesting and, and gets lost uh, in, in, in our uh, sort of voluminous talk every day about, about big data and AI is that climate and weather were sort of the original big data topics going back to the 1960s. Pattern recognition and, and machine learning in, in some ways cut their teeth very early on these topics. And so four or five decades later now, what we're seeing is this really interesting marriage of, uh, of highly sophisticated, highly advanced, cutting edge AI being applied to sort of less cutting edge, sort of kludgy, you know, government supported uh, models that evolved over the last few uh, decades. Uh, and, and that combination of these, this old approach to modeling with these new AI tools is producing some really interesting startups uh, at, at exactly the time we're going to need them most.